Norvig is uh, Mr. Artificial Intelligence. He taught the Stanford class online at, at 160,000 participants or something. So, uh, Peter, you're there now. Yeah, I'm here. Do, do you do a, a, a PowerPoint presentation or you just want to talk or uh, uh, answer questions? I just want to talk. I don't, I don't have any uh, slides prepared and, you know, I'm coming in uh, okay. sort of in the middle of this conversation. I'm not sure exactly where your, where your group is heading. I heard a little bit of, of uh, what went on in the last presentation and, uh, you know, saw a little bit of the overview, but I'll just talk.
Offline, some ham-fisted operator hit the st uh, the the end. Okay, you back now? Yeah, we're back. Uh, you used the word schema there, and the question I have is that you started out with saying you keep all the originals and you annotate with semantics, and now you're talking about a schema. That and we we didn't get to the schema part, which was my question. Do you have predefined schemas, ontologies, or or, or uh, you know taxonomies that you use for at any time? Right. So, so I guess I've been using the word sort of generically and, uh, and however you want to use it. Uh, at Google, we don't have a, a formal ontology, but we uh, create uh, ontologies sort of on the fly, and they're uh, kind of uh, word clusters rather than uh, canonical terms. Right. So we don't try to say, you know, here's how we make up the world into pieces. Rather, we say, uh, here's a word, and uh, these are all the related words, and this forms this uh, cloud, and there's a distance measure between adjacent words, and we uh, sort of annotate things that way, uh, rather than trying to force them uh, into one meeting. 
Is it useful to make a comparison between how you do that and how Bill Inman does that with Psalms? Uh, I, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's the same model. Uh, Psalms self-organizing maps. He does the same thing, but very systematically uh, across database structures. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I should you know. say, you know, so one example, uh, you know, so I'm talking mostly about my experience with the core search. Uh, we had a process in our uh, social product, the uh, uh, G Plus, where we said, okay, now we want to do something that's slightly different than search. We want to uh, push notifications to you of, hey, one of your friends uh, said this, or here's something you might be interested in. So there is no search, no information need, but rather we had to have some idea of these are the types of stuff you might like. And we started that project off by trying to define that ontology to say, uh, you know, here are the topics uh, you might be interested in sports. And uh, within that, there's uh, baseball and basketball and so on. And built that ontology down to some level and tried to classify things into that ontology and then tried to serve them up. Uh, and we pursued that line for quite a while and then decided that it just uh, wasn't good enough, that the recommendations we were getting weren't good enough. And part of it was that uh, people just uh, didn't follow our categories. Uh, so, uh, you know, there were some people who just like baseball, but there were other people who, uh, you know, only followed a particular team. So we could go back and say, now let's break up baseball ontology into each team. Uh, but there were other people who sliced the world in different ways, and that uh, they said, well, we're only interested in this part of uh, this topic that you define. And it proved to be too hard for us to always go back and re-slice up the world. And eventually we said, uh, okay, this isn't working very well. Let's go back to the technology that we know, uh, rather than trying to classify something into an ontology of just saying, let's take all the words uh, in, a, uh, in a blog post or whatever and try to classify those. And it turned out that that worked better, that we were able to track people's interests not by having a small list of these are the categories you're interested in, but by having a much larger list of here's the things you've seen in the past that you've expressed interest in. So the coding was less uh, succinct. We had to keep a larger history of what your interests are, but uh, the matches turned out to be much better. Thank you, Peter. Um I have a, a question for you, but I'll, let me ask this, anybody else have any questions for you right now? Okay, um, I'm sorry, did I hear somebody? No. Um, question I had was, um, we're, we're kind of brainstorming the possibility of a, uh, a rethinking of, of medical informatics on this kind of a selectionist model of evolutionary growth from a, a simple beginnings. And conceptually, we, we, let's just say we had Kaiser, VA, and DOD in the same uh, sandbox somehow, that, you know, three of the largest uh, patient databases there. And we wanted to take a fresh look at it with, say, machine learning algorithms or latent semantic indexing or I don't know what, but the point is we have scale here, I mean, possibly within our reach. And if we did have that reach and we could address these problems, what would your advice be for, for making sense of all of this raw clinical data that uh, sometimes is coded, sometimes it's just free text? Yeah. Uh, so I guess the first question is, what, what do you mean by make sense? Um, you wanna... Come up with an Aristotelian hierarchy. I don't know. Um, the, um, meaningful clinical, clinical input. Meaningful, yeah, clinical, meaningful clinical feedback is what? Yeah. What I'm thinking, it, it, it makes sense to the clinician that's that's using it. I mean, once Reed is saying meaningful clinical feedback that makes sense to the clinician that's using it. So it's the physician okay. at a Google search bar type of thing or something like that. But it's a search right. discovery so make, process. Make some recommendation of uh, uh, diagnosis or prognosis or uh, treatment recommendation. Or yeah, let's just let's just click to the stick with the clinically relevant stuff. I, I'm not sure the doctors want recommendations of diagnosis, but they want to have support right. to come to their own. But um, 
given that we have this corpus of potential space that we could search, um, what, what innovations might we look for? What innovations might you look for? Uh, okay, so I just so I guess I, you know I don't know too much about what those databases look like, uh, and uh, so I imagine that part of the problem is that they are messy and uh, they're incomplete and uh, and uncertain, and sometimes you can't read the handwriting, and sometimes there are uh, errors in the entries where they write down the wrong number or something. And dupli um, duplicate social security numbers, uh, a lot of images, yeah. x-ray images, uh, stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it is coded. Um, ideally, everything would be, but um, we also have a lot of historical stuff. Uh, one of the richer things that at least the VA and DOD have is a, a fairly rich um, context that you could go back and find um, innovative links between things. You could find out two who, which veterans served together in the, the same unit in, in yeah. Iraq or whatever. Uh, so social network analysis could be applied to it too. You do have, um, not necessarily, of course, you, an image is one thing, but you do have a lot of text. Image and free text, yes. You have a lot of free text, which is not discreet, but it, it's, a, it's a wealth of information. You know that it's called a patient history, but you don't know what, and you know that it's English, but that's a bit it. It might be partitioned up by date, for example might be partitioned up by date, or it might be generated by a uh, fill-in-the-blanks right. checkbox that says A, B, or C, D, or E, or F, and, and so suddenly you get everybody saying the, uh, the easiest clickable items. Anyway, right. it's, it's, not, it's not tightly controlled, shall we say. But the point is, what can you do with, with large-scale uh, understanding and machine learning? And uh, I told the audience about it. Peter described uh, how Google... Uh, built up their Arabic language translator uh, simply by machine learning text in, in Arabic. There weren't no uh, grammar grammarians there. So, I mean, if we had this thing of, you know, 20 million patient records for 30 years, what, 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 what could we do with it with uh, innovative uh, large-scale thinking? interesting to play with it. Uh, I don't know what would come out of it, right? So you can, uh, I mean, part of the problem is that uh, most diseases are rare, uh, you know, and people are, are healthy most of the time. Uh, and so it's, uh, you know, it's not like doing the uh, machine translation where they are, uh, you know, the common phrases are all common. Yeah. And so we have lots of examples of them. Here, you you know, what you mostly got is the exceptions. Uh, so that makes it a little bit harder. It's also hard because uh, you haven't recorded the, the common stuff, right? So it's hard to say, you know, a doctor knows, oh, uh, when this reading is at this level, uh, that's unusual. Uh, but the system may not know that because uh, it only has exposure to uh, the people that are sick. Uh, and... So I think that makes it harder to do a, uh, a strict machine learning approach, that you, you've got this biased view of the world, uh, and so it's going to need to be more grounded in uh, some sort of theory of uh, here's what the, the norms are, and then uh, these patients are out of the norm in some way. Um, you could start to look for these types of, of correlations, saying... Uh, you know, just cluster. Speech recognition, you could even throw Google Glass in there, um, similar concepts, in, um, and also the, the parsing of, of data-rich elements in the electronic medical record for outcomes measures. So, for example, in large databases like Kaiser and DOD would have, much of that data is structured for outcomes at least, and if you were to correlate or tag that to conversations that either the physician had with the patient, or physician-physician, or just patient in the waiting room, maybe reporting their symptoms, and then t tag that to um, if you correlate those with potential outcomes, you could provide real-time feedback and real-time decision support to the providers, maybe even through an interface like Google Glass. 
where if I'm sitting there in the patient's, I mean, imagine in the ED where I was two days ago. And I'm sitting there and I'm, if I'm talking to a woman who broke her foot, well, and I'm looking at the foot and I'm talking with her about how it happened and the location I describe it, then if there's some real-time feedback to me that, oh, you want to consider neurovascular compromise in that area of the foot, be sure you consider, you know, that type of thing, that's, that's very helpful. That might have come out of the conversation, you know, my speech, her speech, maybe her report in the waiting room or something, but you've obviously need, you obviously need to tag that and correlate it with potential outcomes. That's, that's where you can tie, you know, tie those things into, into the database. So that's, that's kind of, um, you know, stream of consciousness thought, but I think, I think there, there could be a confluence of some technologies there. there. Uh, one, I, I certainly agree that trying to capture more of these uh, informal conversations is very important. Uh, that, you know, patients say things and doctors make remarks that, that uh, are important at the moment because they're focused at the moment. And sometimes these get lost and don't get recorded and then you go back and try to reconstruct it and you can't. Uh, we actually had a, a study I was looking at recently of uh, uh, programming, where if you if you have the engineers uh, speaking to a microphone as they're programming, uh, then somebody who's trying to understand the program later on does much better. Because if you wait and ask the programmers to put in formal documentation, they always put that off until the last minute, and uh, and then it's incomplete. But if uh, as they're programming, uh, you have the mic on and they say, okay, now I'm going to try to do such and such. Uh, that turns out to be much more effective. Uh, and so it'd be great to try to capture more of that. Uh, you mentioned the Google Glass. I think that's interesting, this idea that there is uh, something, and I don't know if, if Google Glass will end up being the right form factor, or, but uh, something that's uh, hands-free and can give you uh, annotations off to the side that don't interrupt your main flow. And so just a little suggestion, hey, ask about this, or uh, here's a possible problem, or, or here's the next thing to consider. Uh, I think that's very useful in some way of getting that. And, you know, and maybe it's in the glass, maybe it's uh, in the office. There's some sorts of displays that are doing that. Uh, I think that's useful as well. Hey, Peter, this is Eric von Schweber from Surveyor Health. I've got a, a two-part question for you. The part one is just to confirm that I think I heard what you said you heard. You said, I heard what you said you said. Uh, you said that one of the things you had looked at is for documents that basically are seeing heavy retrieval, there's value to doing some types of uh, semantic markup on that, that which is produced through whatever vector-based method you're using so that you don't necessarily have to do that on subsequent retrievals. Is that correct? That's right. So, so uh, you know, there's always this trade-off of uh, do you do the work at, when you uh, store it or when you retrieve it? And so we, we talk about that trade-off and then uh, uh, and part of what we base it on is uh, how much work do we think there's going to be in the future. Okay. So my, my question on that is, the, I'm assuming the original document is not changing. If so, it's probably versioned and is seen as a new document instance. So let's say you've That's got right. that document being accessed over time. Based on the, ret the subsequent retrieval and search activity, do you end up modifying that semantic metadata that you've attached to it? Yeah, so... Uh I mean, I guess one way we look at it is uh, we're we're always uh, kind of uh, re-indexing speech recognition. You could even throw Google Glass in there, um, similar concepts, in um, and also the the parsing of of data rich elements in the electronic medical record for outcomes measures. So, for example, in large databases like Kaiser and DoD would have much of that data is structured for outcomes at least, and if you were to correlate or tag that to conversations that either the physician had with the patient, or physician-physician, or just patient in the waiting room, maybe reporting their symptoms, 
and then tag that to um, if you correlate those with potential outcomes, you could provide real-time feedback and real-time decision support to the providers, maybe even through an interface like Google Glass, where if I'm sitting there in the patient's, I mean, imagine in the ED where I was two days ago, I'm sitting there and if I'm talking to a woman who broke her foot, well, and I'm looking at the foot and I'm talking with her about how it happened and the location I describe it, then if there's some real-time feedback to me that, oh, you want to consider neurovascular compromise in that area of the foot, be sure you consider, you know, that type of thing, that's, that's very helpful. That might have come out of the conversation, you know, my speech, her speech, maybe her report in the waiting room or something, but you've obviously need, you obviously need to tag that and correlate it with potential outcomes. That's, that's where you can tie, you know, tie those things into, into the database. So that's, that's kind of, um, you know, stream of consciousness thought, but I think, I think there, there could be a confluence of some technologies there. there. Uh, one, I, I certainly agree that trying to capture more of these uh, informal conversations is very important. Uh, that, you know, patients say things and doctors make remarks that, that uh, are important at the moment because they're focused at the moment. And sometimes these get lost and don't get recorded and then you go back and try to reconstruct it and you can't. Uh, we actually had a, a study I was looking at recently of uh, uh, programming, where if you if you have the engineers uh, speak into a microphone as they're programming, uh, then somebody who's trying to understand the program later on does much better. Because if you wait and ask the programmers to put in formal documentation, they always put that off until the last minute, and uh, and then it's incomplete. But if, uh, as they're programming, uh, you have the mic on, and they say, okay, now I'm going to try to do such and such, uh, that turns out to be much more effective. Uh, and so it would be great to try to capture more of that. Uh, you mentioned the Google Glass. I think that's interesting, this idea that there is uh, something, and I don't know if, if Google Glass will end up being the right form factor, or, but uh, something that's uh, hands-free and can give you uh, annotations off to the side that don't interrupt your main flow. And so just a little suggestion, hey, ask, ask about this, or uh, here's a possible problem, or, or here's the next thing to consider. Uh, I think that's very useful in some way of getting that. And, you know, and maybe it's in the glass, maybe it's uh, in the office, there's some sorts of displays that are doing that. Uh, I think that's useful as well. Hey, Peter, this is Eric von Schweber from Surveyor Health. I've got a, a two-part question for you. The part one is just to confirm that I think I heard what you said you heard. You said, I heard what you said you said. Uh, you said that one of the things you had looked at is for documents that basically are seeing heavy retrieval, there's value to doing some types of uh, semantic markup on that, that which is produced through whatever vector-based method you're using so that you don't necessarily have to do that on subsequent retrievals. Is that correct? That's right. So, so uh, you know, there's always this trade-off of uh, do you do the work at, when you uh, store it or when you retrieve it? And so we, we talk about that trade-off and then uh, uh, and part of what we base it on is uh, how much work do we think there's going to be in the future. Okay. So my, my question on that is, the, I'm assuming the original document is not changing. If so, it's probably versioned and is seen as a new document instance. So let's say you've got right. that document being accessed over time. Based on the, ret the subsequent retrieval and search activity, do you end up modifying that semantic metadata that you've attached to it? Yeah, so... Uh I mean, I guess one way we look at it is uh, we're, we're always uh, kind of uh, re-indexing. Uh, uh, so if, a, if the document itself changes, then you're right. We see that as a, as a brand new one. If it doesn't change, uh, we, we may end up reprocessing it anyways uh, because uh, our systems change. And, you know, it's too hard for us to figure out exactly what needs to be reprocessed and what doesn't. So eventually we end up reprocessing everything. And so as 
as we make changes, our interpretation of it will change next time we get around uh, to reprocessing it. Uh, so that's part of it. And then where do those changes come from? So some of it comes from changes to our algorithms or changes to the data we have, right? So we want to, for each word in the document, you generate synonyms for that, and the set of synonyms you get will be constantly changing as we get new experience. And, and so we trade off do you generate those synonyms and annotate the document with them, or do you, when you get a query, do you generate synonyms for the query? And there's a, you know, a whole art to uh, making that trade off properly. So, so, uh, the, so those sin sets that may be changing over time, part of that change is as a result of the end users doing search activity and possibly bringing new context to bear. That's right. Right. So we get, we. We get information from our users, you know, they ask one thing and then they use a slightly different word and then they're happy with the result and we say, oh, uh, you know, maybe our user thought that these two words were the same. Uh, and then we also update it through uh, use on the web, that new documents get published, uh, you know, new terminology comes into play and we track that. John has a long history in medical informatics, by the way, and uh, knows a lot of the people you were talking to originally here. But uh, I'll let him ask some questions here. So um, I think you mentioned, Peter, that you were previously with uh, one of the uh, medical semantic organizations. By well, I wasn't actually with the organization, but I worked with a guy who was. And, uh, Mark Tuttle. And, uh, oh, with Mark, yeah. with Mark Tuttle? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Mark well. Yeah. Um, so, um, the, the reason that Tom, I think, brought us all together was to try and think through how to escape this uh, quagmire that we're in with uh, dueling medical ontologies and semantic representations and incompatibility of data sets and how do we get to a point where we can actually aggregate data in a way that's meaningful and, and get things done. So I, I have a couple of thoughts that I've just been sort of typing down in the last half hour or so. Um, so the first thing I'll start off with is, you know, Einstein's famous, famous quote, if you had a problem, an hour to solve a problem, you spend 55 minutes finding the right question and then five minutes answering the question. So I, I'm going to come back to that at the end. This is probably like five or ten minutes. I'm going to try and go through fairly quickly. But the end of that is um, what perhaps is the right set of questions. Um, so in, in the reductionist sense, um, if you think about medical knowledge, it's sort of the genome, the phenome, and the epigenome, everything that influences the, the expression of genes uh, to represent in the human health experience. And with genomics exploding, um, uh, not only with the sciences of transcriptomics and proteomics and metabolomics, but also the metagenomics and associated microbiomics, um, we're, and, and I'm doing some work right now with Larry Smarr, um, who's very deep in this space, um, there are increasingly uh, uh, a recognition that th there are certain principles that, that apply to each of those domains, but in addition, they have very complex interactions um, syst systematically with the immune system, with the endocrine system, with the neural system, and there are other interactions that are organ-specific, spe and we also know from the work that James Fowler and Nick Christakis and others have done that there's a tremendous amount of interaction with social networks. And so um, if, if, if you look at all the factors that are relevant to healthcare and wellness, um, we're crossing many multi multiply complex, internally complex systems, and we're looking, and we're looking for the signal in the interactions of those systems. So it, it becomes um, a, a pretty big problem. Um, and sort of in the, the ultimate tautology of all, um, what's relevant to healthcare is everything that influences us, which is basically everything we perceive, which is basically all knowledge about everything. And so when you start trying to create exclusion sets, there's really not much you can exclude in the context of defining someone's journey through life and their health and wellness. And so of the three classical data types, uh, 
uh, text, image, and time series, uh, there's almost a four set, and it's what I call the X4 mashup of those three against some sort of um, uh, graphical representation of, of networked knowledge or a knowledge model. And um, in, in that back, backdrop, uh, backdrop is the problem of uh, matching a semantic representation uh, to the task that you're trying to do. And so, um, you know, I've, I've been engaged in designing lots of different databases for different purposes. And what you find is the, um, the way you structure information and the way you structure knowledge is only as good as the design principles, which should be faithful to the intended use of those data. And so then it gets back to my original observation of Einstein's, you know, asking the right question. And so there's all different kinds of purposes for health data that are at play today, but there's three sort of generic um, purposes that have complex subsets. The first is documentation and communication of clinical conditions for treatment purposes. That's the traditional health record paradigm. Um, the second is discovery of new knowledge. And the third is um, what you're referring to is applying the knowledge set against the, uh, the observed the observations of an individual. And so given that different representation models actually function better for different purposes, it's really important that we understand what, what problem we're trying to solve or what purpose we're trying to consider um, these, whether we're, we're looking purely at knowledge generation, we're looking at applied knowledge, or whether we're looking at documentation of what's actually occurring. And so I think the question of what is the ultimate single way to represent a you know, universal health language may not be the right question. Um, and, and it's my own bias that um, there may be a representation that's ideal for knowledge discovery. There may be a representation that's ideal for clinical documentation as, as in a health record. And there may be some sort of um, hybrid form that helps apply the knowledge base against the data substrate. Um, but I'm, um, I'm listening to a lot of orthogonal arguments, not, not, just, not just here, but um, the, the academic listeners on this topic are, are just flaming right now. The last two to three weeks have probably been the most active in years on this very topic. And it's mostly, it's mostly gibberish um, because everybody's grabbing one toe of one leg of the elephant and, and seizing on that as the ultimate virtue. Um, but so um, I, I'm, I'm happy to return to the Google model of discovery, and we're doing some of that with our large data set at Kaiser Permanente right now with the machine learning. Um, but I, I think that we need to be very careful, carefully understanding the, the, which question we're really asking, um, which, which, which is dependent upon what purpose uh, we're going to put the data to. I'm done. I totally agree. I, I think that's a great point. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I was talking, I was thinking more of uh, what can we do to help this patient. Uh, but I think you're right that there's a completely separate issue of what can we learn across uh, all patients that will uh, help us in the future. Uh, and I think, you know, as a field, uh, you guys haven't worked this out yet, right? So we have this HIPAA law that's uh, great in the first case that it protects my privacy as an individual, uh, but it also hurts me as a, a member of a larger species for which it would be great if I could share more of my information so that somebody else could use that uh, anonymized information to uh, make some inferences and, and uh, learn more about people in general. Uh, and uh, I think we haven't made that trade-off properly, and, and maybe it's because you haven't Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, we're obviously not on our schedule here, our agenda, but... Uh, well, neither uh, is healthcare. <laughs> neither is healthcare. <laughs> Art imitates life, right? Um, this is great. Couple, Two comments. One is I, I interviewed uh, Gio Wiederhold last time I was up to, when we had dinner, and uh, he, he talked about this subject saying that universal health language is a silly question to ask about and that, that medicine naturally breaks into 
languages around cohesive communities or coherent communities.